Woo! And we're live. Okay, morning, everybody. Evening, good afternoon, wherever you are from. I'm really excited um, because it's Friday afternoon, my favorite day. It's Poets Day. And for those that don't know what Poets stands for, it's piss off early. Tomorrow is Saturday. And I'm very excited because we've got um, a guy coming on from the UK called Aid McCormack, who's the head of the Digital Readiness Institute in the UK. And I've seen Aid speak a few times. And I think what Aid's going to do is really make you think a little bit about the next normal. Forget the new normal. We're talking about the next normal and what that's going to mean for you, your business, as we enter what they call this fourth industrial revolution, which is really, really exciting. Um, and as you know, I'm from Nottingham. And, you know, being from Nottingham, we're, 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 we're not new to inventing things. And I'll just give you a few things, just so you know how cool my home city is. We invented things like uh, the VHS video recorder, which is very cool. I think that was back in 1963. We invented HP Source in Nottingham. The Salvation Army comes from there in, I think, in 1860s. Tarmac on the roads, lace. And my mum used to take me downtown to buy lace because she was a wedding dresser. And she was one of the first entrepreneurs that I ever knew. Um, we invented also traffic lights. Paul Smith, the designer, comes from Nottingham. Uh, football, if you didn't know, originates from Nottingham. The, the very first world, the world's first, very first uh, professional football club is Notts County. Uh, and that's why Juventus have the black and white strip, because they copied Knox County. Ibuprofen, the MRI scanner, and my favorite, Robin Hood. So all those things are notably from my hometown. Um, innovation is what it's called. And there's a very, very cool word that, I, that everyone should know. It's called Luddite. And that also originates from Nottingham. And Luddites are people that don't really adapt to technology too well. Now, if you're a Luddite, you're going to have to listen to aid because aid's going to help you understand how to move and, and, and adapt with the times. But first of all, I just want to thank all of our clients this week for giving us a lot of fun. Um, the nitros, the rubrics, the netscopes, uh, the crowd strikes, the blackberries, the cloud flares, the Bidens. We're very, very grateful for your, for your business and for your support. As I know, our, our, our um, Starlight Children Foundation, we've donated hundreds of thousands of dollars over the past sort of three, three or four months. We're very excited about that. And I also want to thank all of our executives um, from, from the NAB, from QBE, from Westpac, from Suncorp, from CBA, from Appen, who pledged their time this week for a meeting for good. Um, we're very, very grateful. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Aid, and I want you to all ask questions if you've got any. Um, I know there's a few of you who are coming online who, who really love this conversation, but literally what they can't teach you at Harvard is what we're going to be delivering for you today. So welcome, Aid. Good morning. Thank you, Carl. Um, oh, great to be here. I can't hear you. <laughs> Hello, Carl. Oh, can yeah, I can hear you now. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for inviting me on, Carl, this morning. Shall I just get on with it? Yeah, it's beautiful. Just absolutely. Great. Okay. Well, 240,000 generations ago, our ancestor came down from the trees and waved goodbye to his chimpanzee family. Fast forward to 72,000 generations ago when mankind first picked up a rock for the purposes of doing something or someone. That was a major day for mankind because on that day, mankind decided to take control of his own destiny by augmenting himself and in turn created the technology industry. Since then, we've seen exponential growth in terms of new technology. We've seen the uh, wheel, uh, the printing press, that ill-fitting exoskeleton uh, that today we refer to as a car. In more recent times, we have seen the desktop computer and the smartphone. So in such is the nature of exponential technology growth that today is a cause for celebration because today is literally the fastest day we have ever experienced in terms of new technology. But by the same token, it's the slowest day we will ever experience again. The uncertainty and volatility that we're seeing in the marketplace today is simply a warm up for what is to come. And of course, that's compounded by biological vectors such as the COVID virus and increasingly man-made uh, technologies such as uh, genomics. Um, so 
in terms of um, myself, I'm a former technologist who today is focused on uh, thought leadership and advising governments and uh, businesses uh, to thrive in this unknowable future. My underlying hypothesis is that if we're to thrive in this uh, post-COVID era, we need to scrutinize business and society through the lens of anthropology. In terms of what I'm going to be covering, I'm going to look at this thing called the digital age. I'm going to look at it from a number of different perspectives. COVID is so profound that it's very likely that terms such as digital age and post-industrial era and so on will be renamed accordingly. For us to really understand how to thrive in this unknowable future, we need to look at all human operating models that have ever existed across all time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back in time and we're going to look at how it was when we were hunter-gatherers. We have been hunter-gatherers for most of our time on the planet. Up until around 12,000 years ago, we were all hunter-gatherers. Human adaptations take around 25,000 years, so we're still wired to be hunter-gatherers. Back then, we spent a lot of our time pursuing lunch across the savannah, so we were highly mobile. We hunted in packs because there's a real danger that lunch might eat us. If we hadn't eaten for several days and food appeared on the horizon at one minute past five, we wouldn't leave it till nine o'clock the next day. Work and life were highly integrated. And chasing prey uh, required us to be creative, required us to make decisions uh, in the moment. And no matter how hard we worked, if we came back to the cave with no food, it was a bad day at the office. Uh, this continued up until the agricultural era around 12,000 years ago. We continue to be mobile. We continue to be social. Uh, animals don't give birth on a nine to five basis. Uh, agriculture requires a high degree of creativity. And of course, we have to make decisions about the present and the future. And again, productivity was a life or death matter. But then around 300 years ago, uh, all of that stopped. We left the villages, we moved to the cities to work in the factories. We stood or sat in the same place all day, every day. We were now paid labor, so there was no um, talking on the factory line. So there went sociality. Now, we worked for economic reasons. We didn't really enjoy it. We looked forward to the end of the day. We looked forward to the end of the week. We looked forward to the end of our lives. We created the notion of work-life balance because we fundamentally hated what we spent the bulk of our day doing. And because we were now cogs in the uh, factory machine, we had to follow the operations manual. So no creativity, thank you. No decision-making, just follow the instructions. Now, we were paid labor. We were paid for our activity. Some of us recognized that you still get paid no matter how little you worked. Uh, you might say the science of laziness was formalized in the industrial era. Now, of course, the factory owners didn't like that, so they brought in their own equivalent of the military police. Today, we refer to them as management, and it's their job to stop lazy people from being reluctant workers. Now, in the last uh, few decades, we've seen changes. We've seen mobility come back into the uh, workplace, not least through the use of mobile technology. We've seen sociality come back in through uh, social media. Uh, we've tried work-life balance, uh, tried doing that at the moment. It doesn't really work. So work-life integration is the way forward. And who doesn't want a job that has a high degree of creativity, autonomy, and for us to be judged on our productivity? So what I've shown you here is a subset of our natural anthropological drivers. And for 300 years, they were suppressed. So the digital age is not the industrial era amped up on tech steroids. It's not for IR or the fourth industrial revolution. It's much more profound. It is as if the vines of nature are pushing up through the concrete factory floor. And what is happening is that we're returning to our true nature. So the digital age is actually the human age. And anthropologists will look back on this in thousands of years time, and they'll talk about the industrial era as a period, a brief period in time when we were at our most disconnected from our true nature. 
So let's have a look at this now uh, from a number of different perspectives. You know that you're working for an industrial era organization if all the decisions are made by a handful of people in a small room, uh, in a you know, well-appointed small room at the top of the building. It's as if to say all the other brains, no need for them, just make them, use them, uh, use them to follow uh, the process manual. So essentially we're underutilizing the brains of everybody. We need to move to a decentralized leadership model or a ubiquitous leadership model so that decisions can be made at the point of threat or opportunity at the time uh, that gets maximum, if you like, return. Another premise is uh, factories or factory-like organizations are obsessed with process. So Six Sigma, uh, Lean. So they essentially think we've got a great uh, business model. It's all about smarter, faster, cheaper. Well, a faster, smarter, cheaper Titanic is still a Titanic. And the third premise is the belief that past successes are an indicator of future successes. To some extent, this is a corollary of the second premise. Um, you know, you believe that what your business model is great, so you just keep polishing it to, if you like, make it more efficient. So if your organization exhibits one or more of these three characteristics, it is, in essence, an industrial era organization. You don't have to be wearing a hard hat or a boiler suit. There doesn't need to be conveyor belts uh, running through your office to be a factory. So where do we go from here? We go from essentially inert factory to what you might call a portfolio of experiments. Most organizations just have a plan A. That's their primary business. We need to create a plan B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. We need to create a portfolio of experiments or, or bets. You might say these bets represent future possible destinies for the organization because one day the digital Grim Reaper is going to come into your plan A reception. It might be in 20 years time. It might be next week. So you better have other sources of cash to kick in or it's game over. Looking now from a talent perspective, we've already seen the automation of blue collar work. We're starting to see the blue collarization of white collar work. None of us are safe. None of us know what we'll be doing in three months or six months time. There's a new definition of talent. The new definition of talent is being able to do something of value that a robot or an algorithm cannot do. If a robot or algorithm can do uh, what you do for a living, uh, at some point, they will be doing it. If your work is primarily process work, that is not good. The work we need to be doing as humans uh, tends to be, uh, well, well, we'll need to involve our cognitive capacity, our ability to be creative, our ability to pattern match, our ability to pick up on weak signals in small data sets, for example. And it's in part a path to mastery that we're taking, but it's also a path to artistry. So the banks, for example, they're on a race to the bottom in terms of automating everything. Eventually they'll have 100% efficient technology factories with very few people involved. But they'll be operating approximately 0% margin because essentially all the banks will be doing the same. So they'll have to consider how do we move back up the value stack? And what they'll conclude is they need to bring people back in. These people won't be corporate compliant cogs. These people will be highly creative individuals whose thoughts and innovations give rise to differentiated customer experiences that command a very high margin. These are people like Salvador Dali, uh, Lady Gaga, Pablo Picasso. Brilliant at what they do, but a bit of a HR nightmare. So, uh, looking now from a, a leadership perspective, uh, I mentioned this idea of the leaders being the superheroes and the rest of us being the automatons that simply just carry out the work by turning the handle. That model needs to change to a more decentralized, more ubiquitous model. One of the interesting things that is happening in respect of uh, the clock speed, if you like, of business is that strategy and tactics are merging. Situational awareness trumps strategy. 
So in the old days, it was, let's build a few pyramids. We're going to need a fair bit of stone and a lot of labor, and it's going to take a certain number of years. Today, business is more like a fighter pilot dogfight. And the fighter pilot that plans all his or her maneuvers before they go up into the air won't be involved in many dogfights. It's all about real time. So the question then arises, um, what happens if you're a manager? Well, it's a problem because essentially in this uh, post-COVID era, we need leaders and we need talent. We don't need managers. We don't need drum beating, carrot and stick waving managers because my next gig totally depends on how I perform during this gig. I am more motivated to do a good job than any manager requires. So we don't need those managers anymore. So the question for you is, are you the talent or are you the leader? And the reality is in this uh, gig economy based world that we're entering into, you need to be both because in the course of a week or even in the course of the day, you might be doing both. So looking now at risk management, um, Many of you, or I say many of you, uh, it's it's unlikely that many of you would have got naught out of 10 for school work, though it is possible, but it's even less likely that you got naught out of 10 well done. I'm here to tell you that you have been part of a conspiracy, a conspiracy that's been propagated by your teachers, by your parents, and perhaps even by your employer as well. And that is the belief that the only path to success is through the avoidance of failure. As a result, we've always striven to get 10 out of 10 or near 10 out of 10. So we've opted for things that make us look good. Therefore, many of us will go to our grave not knowing what our full mental and physical potential was. If we look back to our ancestors, they were very curious. They were very um, courageous. They were constantly exploring uh, new things, uh, the boundaries, how far they could take things. And we need to be grateful for them because if it wasn't for them, we would be doing this today in a cave. Mm -hmm. So our ancestors have been curious, have been courageous. They've essentially taken risks. And, you know, uh, we've evolved as a result. Uh, the industrial era has quelled our appetite for risk taking. But in the digital age, risk management means risk acquisition. And I believe we owe it to our ancestors to uh, adopt this philosophy. Silicon Valley, for example, is predicated on it. So the industrial era, if you like, cultivated a certain synthetic certainty. I knew that if I built a factory to make something such as cars, there'd be enough interest in cars for long enough for me to justify the investment in the factory. That is no longer the case. Prior to the industrial era, we had uncertainty. It was dangerous out there on the savannah. Today, we have hyper uncertainty because of technology. Everything's connected to everything. And, and global supply chains also contribute. So everything affects everything. This is HBR's problem. Uh, fundamentally, business schools in general struggle with this uh, chaotic, unknowable future. Their whole uh, case study based model uh, simply doesn't work because the case studies were based during a period of synthetic certainty. There are no case studies for an unknowable future. Every scenario is going to be different. And a large part of HBR's, uh, I say Harvard Business Review, Harvard Business School, and all the other business schools is that their MBAs are predicated on strategy, on multi-year plans, and so on. All of that is out the window. Now, last year, I was involved with all the major MBA uh, players in EMEA uh, and, and presented not dissimilar to this, and, and they essentially agreed. What you'll start to see is the old school MBAs sprinkled with technology buzzwords. So a bit of IoT, a bit of 3D printing, but essentially it is trying to um, decorate 
uh, the old factory model, so to speak. So that, that's a problem for them. Um, so looking at this from a sort of technical perspective, the robots are here. We see them in the workplace. We see them in the uh, care homes, hotels, restaurants. A number of um, robots got sacked recently for what might be described in a restaurant, for what might be described as soup delivery mismanagement. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not 100 percent, but they are getting increasingly intelligent. They can pick up on emotional signals. So we do have to be careful from a kind of workplace friendships perspective. So when you come into work and your cobot winks at you, oh does that suggest that they need a reboot? Does it suggest that they are operating on the basis that the friendlier they are, the harder you'll work? Or is it because their learning algorithm has picked up enough about your job to know it's your last day at the office? So the robots are here and we're going to see a lot more of them. The question is, is this going to be something for the IT department to focus on or something for HR? We're already seeing in some countries where they're considering taxing robots as if they are humans. Now, as a child of the 60s, I was expecting full anthropomorphic robots in the home by the year 2000. That hasn't happened. And I'm very disappointed by that. In many respects, AI has not moved on at all in the last 50 years. What we have seen are advances in computer processing power, computer storage, and some maths parlor tricks, which is also known as machine learning. What we have today at best is artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, until neuroscience, and neuroscience has made great strides over the last few years, but it needs to make greater strides before we're truly uh, mimicking how the brain operates. Had not that said, um, AI is doing a good, good job in terms of um, back-end robot process automation, for example, but having AI at the front end is not dissimilar to having a call center where everyone's on a strict diet of barbiturates. It's not a great experience. So the internet that enabled us to communicate with each other, the internet of things allow our household appliances to chatter about us behind our backs. As portables become wearables, as wearables become embeddables, the internet of things becomes the internet of things in people. We've been on a convergence course with technology for many, many years since we first picked up that rock. I would go as far as to say that we're experiencing a species change. We're moving from Homo sapiens to Homo extensis. Now, I don't know if that is true or not, but the point is we're becoming more augmented and augmented people require augmented services. So that, that has profound implications for us if you are a service provider. So let's look now at how we might uh, structure a, a business going forward. First, we need to understand that all industrial era models are essentially fragile. That is to say, they were designed to take one set of forces or a a steady state set of forces. So if you take a plate, for example, a plate is strong in one direction. You can potentially stand on a plate. But if you bang a plate off the side of the table, it cracks. It's fragile. That's how industrial organizations and industrial era organizations are. You could aim for a robust organization. That is to say, a bit like the uh, boxer who gets punched. He or she goes to the ground, but they get back up. But over time, they take longer to get up uh, and eventually they don't get up. So that's not good enough. So people talk about resilience and resilient organizations. This is a bit like dropping the uh, rubber ball and it comes back to your hand with no loss of energy. That's good, uh, but we can do better. We need to create, in my view, super resilient organizations. These are organizations that get stronger with adversity they get stronger with the more force they encounter. Like a samurai warrior that gets bigger and stronger the more they fight on the battlefield. Now, this is a characteristic of living organisms. 
We face adversity, our character gets stronger. We go to the gym, for example, in more modern times, uh, we hurt ourselves in order to become stronger. So we need to move from this old school, if you like, inert factory model to what you might regard as a data-driven, sensing, situationally aware, real-time living organism. That's the new model for businesses. Now, I've developed a, a methodology for um, helping organizations make this journey. I don't have time to go into it, but I'll share with you some of the underlying um, premises associated with my uh, tribal methods. I encourage organizations to focus on growing assets and not making a profit. Uh, not so much not making a profit, but not uh, giving the profit away to shareholders. It's a bit like um, it, it forces short term thinking and it's a bit like failing the famous marshmallow test. I want it all now. If you create a strong set of assets, they will generate flows of cash and they will act as a buffer for an unknowable future. Amazon is not focused on making a profit. Amazon is focused on growing its asset, particularly its market share asset. Smart organizations, as I mentioned before, are focused on acquiring risk. Elon Musk, for example, entered a very mature, consolidated marketplace, and now is holding his own in terms of uh, electric vehicles. Uh, he's also taking some risks in respect of his uh, Twitter tweets, but that's, that's another story. Uh, Snapchat, the founder of Snapchat, or the founders of Snapchat, could have sold Facebook, uh, should, could have sold Facebook to Snapchat, uh, could have sold Snapchat to Facebook um, for a large sum of money, but they held on. And today the operating income per employee at uh, Snap is a third of a million dollars per person, not too shabby. Innovation trumps process, in particular, data-driven uh, innovation. So, of course, we've got the Uber, Ubers, the Airbnbs, uh, the Tinders, and so on. We've got old-school players like Rolls-Royce and John Deere, the tractor maker, turning data into value for their customers. Uh, I work with a, a Chinese company called Hire, and they have um, an amazing model, which essentially is they created an ecosystem of small uh, enterprises. And each of these small uh, micro enterprises is strongly connected to the market and the people are rewarded based on how well they do in the market. It is the most innovative business model I have encountered. Let humans be humans. So create environments that meet our anthropological needs, our needs to be mobile, our needs to be social, uh, creative, curious, and so on. Uh, companies that I've worked with, such as uh, Google, uh, Salesforce, Workday, um, they've created, you know, in some cases, cognitive gymnasiums, where essentially people, just by virtue of engaging with the building, in effect, um, you know, amplify their cognitive potential. And finally, uh, be tribal. As I highlighted earlier, us operating as a tribe is optimized for very uncertain, harsh conditions. We're wired to be tribal. We're at our best when we're tribal. Um, uh, this organization I've described, Hire, um, it is a tribe of tribes. It is a super tribe. Uh, Spotify, for example, is another uh, tribe of tribes, though so its tribes are less market facing and more, if you like, functional or, or departmental. So I don't know whether that will be successful or not. Uh, old school player Microsoft uh, was very uh, tribal, you know, operating system versus desktop uh, and so on. Um, but it had the super tribe perspective of us versus the world. Under Satya Nadella, it's us and the world, which is a smarter move. The name of the game today is not to um, simply own the market, it's to own the ecosystem. And if you own the hub or the platform at the center of that ecosystem, uh, you own the ecosystem. So going forward, uh, next steps. Um, 
If you're interested in uh, transformation, I've got a free uh, online uh, transformation course. Uh, by all means, uh, take a look at that. And uh, definitely connect on LinkedIn if you're interested in sort of um, uh, you know, what I'm up to and I produce quite a lot of content and share it on LinkedIn. Specifically in terms of corporate next steps, create this cognitive gymnasium, create an environment where people come to work out cognitively, to do great work with other great people, where they get to be mobile, they get to be social, they get to basically have an integrated work and life. We all know about home working, but what about work homing? Are you able to operate in your organization and get on with your, if you like, home chores without getting uh, scornful looks from your colleagues? Turn your business into a business laboratory. Start creating those experiments. This is going to be a great time if you're a mergers and acquisitions lawyer because you can acquire experiments, but I encourage you to grow your own as well. And of course, uh, build assets because assets are a buffer against uh, the risks associated with an unknowable future. And from an individual uh, perspective, think of your career as a lean startup. When you were young, you might have wanted to have been a princess or an astronaut. I won't tell you which one I wanted to be. But if I, for example, stuck at my uh, interest in becoming a database expert uh, when I first started out in IT, today I'd be lip syncing country music outside Oxford Circus tube station. The market's moved on. We don't need database experts anymore. So as a result, I go to sleep with one eye open. I'm paranoid. I wake up each day and think, am I economically relevant? And if not, I go and acquire the skills to keep me in play. Career management is a real-time activity. Work on your street smarts. We're back on the savannah. You don't want to be that little Bison Frise doggy uh, that's released into the jungle uh, to be then surrounded by a bunch of capuchin monkeys who have decided that you're lunch and have no way of dealing with that. We've become very den denatured because of the industrial era. We need to get our wits back. We need to be smart. It's it's. It's literally a jungle out there now. And those of us that are formally educated and have this sense of entitlement that we're owed a career, you're in for a shock. Mm. And practice deliberately. Virtuoso violinists practice. They don't just perform and that's it for the day. They practice, they practice at home. They practice the scales, wait, that's easy. They could do that whilst watching Netflix, but they don't. They practice it with such neuronic intensity that it hurts, and it hurts because they're re-architecting their brain. They're making new neural connections in their brain. They're architecting their brain for greatness. The question, so the question is, what are we doing to architect our brain for greatness, to make us world-class or to keep us world-class? So to conclude, um, in essence, uh, uh, the world is changing, the world of work is changing. We're returning to our true nature, but there's a twist. Uh, we are becoming more augmented. The uh, industrial, uh, the 20th century was the era of information technology. The 21st century is the era of biology. So what with developments in genomics, bionics, bioinformatics, synthetic biology, and even nootropics, the augmentations that we're going to see in the next few years are going to be profound. And again, that has profound implications for us as service providers. But of course, are we not going to be that augmented talent as well? So that has tremendous implications for us as uh, consumers and as citizens. And in that most exacting of management sciences, parenting. I believe that if you embrace this anthropological reality, you'll be in a better position to thrive in this uh, uh, post-COVID era. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Um, so to sum that up then, um, we're going back to the cave. It doesn't matter if you were educated formally. Um, I'm half cyborg because I'm super connected to my mobile phone already. And <laughs> what a fascinating conversation. You, you know, I think 
for me, um, a, there are so many things in there. The hunter-gatherer thing, we can really blame the farmers then for the introduction of agriculture for, the, for this shift. It was a major, major shift. Um, and some people would argue that that was where we took a downhill turn because we started to overproduce. Uh, we started to create the concept of ownership. And here we are. It's really interesting. I, you know, I look at how many things actually shifted. When you, one of the things that stood out for me there was twelve thousand years ago, we were all hunter gatherers on the savannah, hunting our food. We we're all happy. We go, to, we go to, we go and hunt for the food. We come back to the cave. We cook it. We share it. We share everything with our friends and our neighbours. And everybody was happy. Then the introduction of agriculture came along, and things changed so bad. And I, I go as far to say, even things like monogamy were introduced by the farmers because everyone, every, every, everything was captured around a farm. You stay at home now, you're mine. We, we're going to do this and that, that's, that's the way it's going to be done. And that's where the introduction of all these neurotic diseases like anxiety come in because people were unhappy at home, didn't want, to be, didn't want to. They wanted to go. So what, you, what you're saying is we're actually pre-wired for the savannah. We're not pre-wired for, for all of this that we've got right now. No, absolutely. The idea of going to some sort of um, air conditioned office and sitting in an awkward position like I am um, all day, living your life in a spreadsheet. No, that's not um, how we are, we are wired. Um, so, you know, we've adapted to some extent, uh, but we're, we're essentially underutilizing our great capabilities, not least our brain. I mean, to give you a, a kind of crude example, uh, I practice parkour for example i know i'm a bit long in the tooth for it but that gets me the opportunity to use braciation for example the shoulder how many people use this wonderful piece of engineering called the shoulder very few you know most people consider in in the business world their body as something that gets their brains from meeting to meeting um you know we have physical uh, aspects to us and as the greek said you know a healthy mind and a healthy body and so on I think the industrial era discouraged the body part, or actually it encouraged the body part and discouraged the cognitive part. Um, but then the, the the body part became a kind of very fixed, you know, hang a, hang a door on a Ford Escort and do that for your career. Um, you know, very peculiar, very weird. People will look back and think that was strange. <laughs> it's really interesting. I, I noticed yesterday in Australia, because we've just gone out, They've just relaxed a lot of the COVID laws now, you, or the, the rules. You're allowed to have 10 people outside on the park. I don't recall ever having 10 friends, never mind being outside with 10 people on the park. You can now have five in your home, and the, some of the cafes are opening up. Has I mean, I know that some of the reports that I've been reading this week have, have shown that 70% that of people are actually working from home are actually happy about it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're actually, they've, they've got more time. And they're, they're, they're more productive, they're 50% 50, 50 more productive and they've got more time and, and they're actually saving money. So has COVID changed things for the better for us? Well, we're, it's still playing out and, and it's great to see that you guys are, um, you know, returning to some degree of uh, normality. But of course, there's the possibility of the second spike uh, and so on. And, and, and COVID being some sort of, you know, uh, regular occurrence and i know covid is not um hiv but they are from the same family and you know hiv has taken around 30 million lives we're perhaps around i don't know 300,000 at the moment globally so we don't quite know how this is going to play out and how profound you know we're at a point now where your your favorite uncle let's say is for all intents and purposes a biohazard uh, certainly here in the uk uh, so we're being almost kind of conditioned to see people as a as a threat. And I'm not sure how long it's going to take it for us to unlearn uh, that. But, ha but coming back to your more positive point. Um, yeah, working from home, uh, opportunity to get reacquainted uh, with your family um, not squandering cognitive capacity because you're standing under the armpit of someone on the tube for you know a couple of hours a day um, there's a lot to be said from working from home um, 
it's easier to get into routines and so on. I can happily wear my jacket and shirt and tutu here without causing any uh, concerns. Um, so the question then arises, what do we do with those great big buildings downtown? And the chances are that they will, over time, probably become urban farms. Mm. As in for, for vertical farming and for, for growing food, fruit and vegetables? Well, what else will we use them for? Right. Well, that's a very interesting point because they, I think Westpac, one of the biggest banks here, have said that they, they might just keep all of the IT teams working from home because so all of a sudden they're already thinking about reducing their footprint inside their big buildings in the city. So that, that, bring, and that, that would then beg the question, what would happen to all the other primary real estate? Maybe that would be forced to lower their prices, which means all the older real estate would just become vacant and and you're right, they're, they're going to have to do something with it, which is really interesting. It's a fascinating subject. And I, I can't help but think this, um, this COVID thing that's been forced upon us has actually forced us to act and get our, our house in order so much quicker than we would have done anyway. And, and, and it's just playing out the way it should have done. In many respects, COVID-19 is the closing ceremony for the industrial era. The yeah. official closing ceremony and i've been rattling on about transformation for a long time and i don't want to sound like i'm some sort of nostradamus um but it's happened i didn't anticipate it being biological in nature but now everybody understands disruption now everybody understands the need for transformation we are living a case study as much as case studies will be relevant uh, for transformation specialists uh, across the world going forward we're all faced with, you know, we can't just um, add more tech to our existing processes. We've got to rethink our business models. And you know, that's it's really interesting. There's, I can't help but think because we we actually help a lot of the, the technology leaders to, um, you know, to, to a lot of the vendors to meet with the technology leaders. And I'm looking around at some of the disasters that's happened this week, just in the tech space, with one big bank, for example, having to write off this huge project. <laughs> It's hundreds of millions of dollars that, that, that is a failed IT project. Yes. And, and I'm looking at companies that are getting hacked and cyber hacked. And there's, there's another one this week and there's two more the week before that. And they're getting held to ransom. And the world has changed so much. It's almost like unless you're making that transition now, you're literally going to be left. You are going to be in, in the jungle being eaten. You are the food. You're, you're literally going to be that food because – I'm seeing big companies here that got held to ransom. Their entire IT systems shut down and encrypted because they couldn't keep them out, basically. And that's just going to force them to – they're going to be irrelevant eventually. Yes. I mean, I think I think of it in terms of uh, T3. Um, so, for example, the CIO um, sees a new technology. It might be 3D printing. It might be AI, whatever. Um takes it to the CEO. The CEO looks at it and says, that's a toy. That's of no use to our uh, business. So the CIO just, you know, that's it. There, I did. I tried. Um, then it becomes a threat because some of the competitors are now starting to embrace it. And then eventually it becomes table stakes. You cannot play in that market unless, unless you've embraced that technology. So toys, threats, and table stakes. And it's the role, in my view, of IT leaders to get themselves into a position where they will get taken seriously and they will get airtime with the CEO to actually talk about uh, new disruptions, new technology disruptions, and in particular, the power of uh, data in terms of uh, it is an asset class and as an asset class that can deliver value to the organization and to the customer as well. How would, just before we wrap this thing up, how would a company harness their employees' cognitive capital? Because that is literally where their, exist, or where their new revenue streams can come from. Um, it's where they can augment their existing revenue by taking, out, taking advantage of what exists inside their companies. There are so many companies here that are 100 years old, and rather than letting those people go, what, what should they do? How could they go about harnessing that knowledge? Um. Well, essentially, um, if you think of job number one is to plug the cognitive leaks. So don't force people to go to the office as some sort of, you know, leadership power trip. 
uh, you know, and particularly during the, uh, the rush hour, because that just leeches cognitive capacity. Design your, your buildings so that um, it encourages mobility, sociality, et cetera, et cetera. Create uh, or acquire IT systems that don't uh, thwart uh, the employee in terms of doing great work. Uh, avoid micromanagement because, again, that just causes the, uh, the employee to tense up. And all of this kind of uh, friction and tension essentially drains your, your, your cognitive, the, the cognitive capacity of your people. Mm-hmm. You know you're in a good, spl- a good, pa- uh, a good place when um, you're a bit like the British cycling team. You're focusing on marginal gains. What are the things that you can do to your business model that help you extract that extra, you know, 1% of cognitive capacity from your people? Once you get into that situation, people will hear about it and you will have the best talent coming to work for you because you offer the best cognitive gymnasium. You offer, in effect, a cognitive Disneyland. Very interesting. Really fascinating. I, I, I just love this stuff. I remember listening to a guy called Peter Hinson once, and he talked about the new normal. This le- really is the near normal, isn't it? This is what we're seeing now. I mean, I, I look at what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink and the ability. We literally are half cyborg already. We've, we're, we're permanently connected to our phone. All that's, all that's missing is a high-speed broadband connection from our brain to our, to our computer in our hand, and we're done. Yeah, that, te- that technology has been proven uh, into weaving, um, you know, uh, human tissue with um, with electronics. So so we're there on, on that front. And, you know, if at the very least, if you want to keep or be perceived as on the money at uh, cocktail parties, uh, use the phrase next normal, because that's the one McKinsey is pumping out at the moment. <laughs> It's a bit yeah. like all of, it's a bit like all the cybersecurity vendors. They've all got their same pitch. It's like artificial intelligence, single pane of glass. They've all gone to a KPMG and got their marketing pitch. Indeed, indeed. Aid, <laughs> hey, you have a wonderful Friday. Thanks so much for taking some time and getting up early. Really, really grateful. Um, I know Anthony Scott, who's who's with them, um, Simply AI, is very fascinated by this, and he said this has been the best session that we've done yet. So very, very grateful for you coming on board and. This will all go up on, on LinkedIn. You can share it and people can watch it. And, and I hope some people come to you because I, I think your talks are fascinating. And for a sales kickoff or for a round table, in fact, we're going to be doing some round tables, virtual ones. And I'd love you to come and talk about this because it's, it really is thought, it's, it, it just evokes all sorts of great things come out of your brain, I think, when you, when you, when you share it. So, so thanks so much. Have a good Thank weekend. You. Thank you, Carl. Take care. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon.